I am Ollie Ollerton and you are watching the disruptive Lilla. <laughs> I am Ollie Ollerton and you are watching the disruptive entrepreneur part. Fucking hell. I always, I always get it with the script. Can't do it. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I am Ollie Ollerton and this is the disruptive entrepreneur podcast. Well, Ollie, thanks for doing the podcast. Pleasure. Really grateful. Um, we were just talking upstairs earlier, mm. actually. You've done something that I'm actually scared of more than anything. And everything you've done in your career, which would be really scary to mm. someone like me, the scariest thing is giving up coffee. That would scare <laughs> me more than anything you've ever done. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're um, on a bit of a fitness kick again, are you? And health kick. Yeah. I mean, since the book came out this year, I mean, this year has been absolute mayhem. You know, the SAS has been out. And then it was into the book, so it's just been constant. And I know, you know, a lot of people were saying, I will say to a lot of people, there's no excuses, you should still find time. You know, I kind of, I got lost along the way. And I did say to you upstairs, you know, as soon as there's a chink, I'm an, I am an extremist. And as soon as something starts, you know, there's a chink, something gets through the wall of my discipline, the whole wall falls down. So I kind of thought, anyway, look, I'm on, I'm on tour. What happens on tour stays on tour. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I just went for, you know, I, th I thought I'm going to use this as an experiment. It's yeah. been an interesting experiment. So I ate when I want, where I wanted, what I wanted, um, coffee, lattes, the whole works. And I don't usually drink coffee, so. No. Um, and I didn't exercise for six weeks. And I just, I got to the point where I thought I'm going to use this as an experiment. I'm going to see how, because it's all right, look, all these fitness people and people that are fit and have been fit for most of their lives it's okay for them to say to everyone, no, it's easy, you just got to make the first move. And I just yeah. wanted to get into the, it's been interesting for me to get into the headspace of where those people are. And for me, I just don't understand, you know, I look back now, not exercising, not eating properly and how that's affected my mindset. And it's been pretty horrendous when I look back, mm. you know, it's, it's not been good. And it kind of gives me a taste of, you know, when I left the military, I went into a downward spiral and it gave me a little taste of that. You know, so I just, it, it just proves to me that, you know, health, good health, eating well, exercising is so important for your mind. Mm. So, so you, you, this downward spiral you talked about, mm. obviously um, your book Breakpoint, I asked you before we went live, is there anything you don't want to talk about? And you said, well, I've put it all in the book anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but what is this downward spiral? What was it for you? And, and how therefore mm. did getting back sort of out of shape yeah. remind you of what that was? Yeah, for me, it's, um, <sighs> you leave the military and I'm not saying this is, this is not for everyone. Mm. So, but I know for, you know, a group of people, a number of people, um, that when they leave the military, you can't, or when, let's say when you're behind the wire, when you're in that institution, you've got your brothers to the left and right, front and center, you've got all this support and everything, you, you're invincible. And you kind of don't understand the things that you take for granted, like the camaraderie, the brotherhood. Um, you, you take that for granted. You think you're going to, you don't actually think, well, where am I going to get my camaraderie from on the outside? Where am I going to, where's the, you know, I'm going to be missing the brotherhood, all that kind of thing. So you take that, you kind of don't even consider it. But when you come out, you then realize when that's stripped away, that there's a massive void in your life. And also the fact is when you're in the military, uh, there's a few things here. First of all, you've got a massive sense of purpose and we as humans need purpose um, on a daily basis. You know, um, there was the fact that there was a lack of purpose straight away as soon as I came out. And almost if I can make it, it's probably more relative if, if I talk about a Premier League footballer, for instance, coming out, you know, they've been at the top of their game for so long and then all of a sudden there's nothing. You know, they've got nothing, there's a massive void there. And for me, and because I didn't have that, have that immediate direction, it, I began to spiral out of control. And I, I truly believe that, you know, the people that don't have those problems are people that have had something that is set in stone. They know exactly what they're doing and they're on that path straight away. But I think there's, you know, a lot can happen to a veteran in a few months, mm. six months, um, where things can go very sort of wayward for them. And for me at that time as well, I mean, I was... I came out, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't focusing on exercise. I started drinking, you know, when I used to drink in the military, it used to be about, you used to go away work. You obviously can't drink doing that. You used to come back and you used to get smashed for a few days. It's, you know, we, we wrote the rules on binge drinking, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I got taught by the best. Yeah. Um, but so when you take that kind of, um, 
that you take that kind of habit into into um, into civilian, you know, civil life. Mm. You know, people look at that and think, well, you've got a bit, you know, it's a bit of a problem. Mm. And for me, you know, although I, you know, I, I used drink as that smoke screen. You know, every time things got too much, it was drink. You drink. You know, every week, you know, your weekends extend to starting on Thursday, and before you know it, it's Sunday. Um, so yeah, and then, then that for me went on and on and on, and you kind of tell yourself you haven't got a problem, you know, because you keep drinking and stuff, and you because you never deal with the raw nerve. But for me, that sort of began on a sort of downward slope. It never, it wasn't crashing down straight away. It, over time, it sort of just layers and layers peeled away, mm. um, and then sort of extend right forward to you know when I finished in Iraq, and I know I'm jumping ahead here, but and I'm sure we'll cover some of those bits, but. You know, when I look back, you know, I look back now and at some points at my lowest, I couldn't even hold a conversation, you know, which I know people who hear this will think, Jesus, I can't imagine that. <laughs> what was going on in your head? You said raw nerve and you've talked about this yeah. spiral. What's going on in your head? How are you feeling? What are you thinking? Just absolutely everything negative, you know, and I, I have got a positive mindset, you know, so that always helped pull me out of that, the, the darkest moments, but I still had a lot of negativity. Nothing was working. I had no purpose. So it was, it was really sort of, you know, and, until I had a, no, I had a drink, everything would be fine. But, um, and when I say drinking, this wasn't on a daily basis. I mean, you know, I'd occupy myself with things throughout the week, but any excuse would be, you'd go and have a drink. But for me, it was, it was extremely negative, um, no motivation to do anything, um, and on a very, very destructive path. And I talk about this in my book, you know, I, I feel at that point, you know, throughout a series of years, I was chasing death. Although, you know, it wasn't a fact like I'm going to try and find a way to die, but when subconsciously, it was almost like I was chasing death. Some of the things I was doing, some of the things I've got up to. Like? Well, I mean, in, for instance, in Baghdad, you know, some of the things I did there, I look back on and it's just absolutely stupid. You know, like going out, tell them not to go out. Absolutely, do not white faces on the street, you will be attacked. I want to go out. Yeah. You know, so I took my whole team out. I had a, an Iraqi bodyguard team and uh, I went out to buy a rug. <laughs> <laughs> but why'd you do that? <laughs> because I, because who I dares wins? <laughs> who dares wins? A carpet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. It's always, I, I have got a thing as well about control. I can't stand people trying to control me. So someone telling me not to do something makes me think I'm going to do it. Yeah. And that comes back to me as well. You know, a lot of things, so I know that's an extreme, but and I think it's, a, it's not a quality in that sense, but it is a quality the way I look at that because I question the status quo with everything because I don't believe that what we're told to do and how we're supposed to live our lives isn't absolutely the correct way or the best productive way in our life, you know, to, to achieve anything in life. Mm. But for me, that was another extreme of that. You know, yeah. someone told me not to do something, and I'm gonna do it. You know, I'll go out, buy a rug, we got attacked. I got the rug and sit at home. Hmm. It's great. As a reminder. <laughs> Smile every time I see it. Yeah. It's a beautiful rug. And but, um, did you get what you want, wanted out of that decision? Well, the, to get the rug? Well, yeah. I mean, you challenged the authority, I guess. You exercised your own control and no one's control over you. You went out, you got attacked, you got the rug, you came back. How'd you feel about that? Yeah, I felt on the high. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's like I beat the system. Yeah. You know, and I did a number of things along that kind of a... What else? Um, like, I mean, we had, used to have parties in Baghdad, you know, and it was every Thursday, Friday was off, you know, the day off in Baghdad, Friday, Thursdays was always a party somewhere, but you would, you know, uh, you would, you would live within these parameters of safety. And that would be, you know, you go to the villa, have a few drinks and stay there. But I mean, I can remember one night it was like no one to leave the villa and I decided to leave the villa on my own. I had an armored Mercedes, AK-47. Um, but it's, you never, you just didn't do that. You know, you yeah. did not live on your own drunk in an armored Mercedes, one of Saddam's old armored Mercedes, and then smashed through Baghdad. And then at one point I got lost, didn't know where I was, and I managed to get to a high point on a bridge. I opened the door to get out to have a look. The AK-47 fell on the floor, followed by me. And I thought, fucking hell, mm. <laughs> yeah. this is a bit much. So, and it, it was, 
again, it was instances like that, you know, I got myself into some, you know, I could have got into some severe shit and I managed yeah. to get home that night, but it was after that, I just thought, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, were you not reprimanded? Yeah, because you're yeah. like, were you not reprimanded for those I things? I was the boss. Oh, so you do what you want. <laughs> I was the and boss. do that you feel like you things. were setting a good example? Yeah, for... well, but no one really knew about that, you know, everyone was still back at the party, I didn't, you know, yeah. back, in, back at that time, it wasn't like everyone was looking up to you, you know, it was the Wild West. Yeah. There was shit going on all over the place. It was absolute mayhem. And there was stuff happening all over the place that was, you know, that was nothing. Yeah. Nothing particularly. But um, for me, again, you know, it's, 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 it was being opposed against the system and someone telling me mm. what to do. I couldn't do this. And I just, it wasn't, it wasn't a case so much I don't think he's right. I'm going to do that because someone's told me not to do it. It's the fact that I will do exactly what I want. No one's going to tell me to do that. Yeah. And yeah. Are you able to use that now in productive ways, maybe in your business, maybe in your book promotion? Do you, can you put, turn that into something positive instead of just a pure challenge of authority? Yeah, no, absolutely. But, um, you know, I think everything I do at the moment is non-conventional. You know, I don't follow the, the, the sort of pre-described path. I don't follow footprints. I make my own path in everything I do. And I think that is, you know, a small percentage of the same kind of mindset. But it's obviously not as extreme. My life's not in danger. But, yeah. you know, everything I do, I mean, I'm always looking for, if everyone says go that way, that's, the, you know, I'm looking for the left and right. And I, th I think that's, if you, you've got to be a lot more diverse, especially in business and, and being personally productive. I think if you just follow the norm, the system, I just don't think you get anywhere in life. Mm. And I don't mean doing things illegally. I just think looking at different ways to do things. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I do think it is of a, of a benefit, but now it's under a controlled manner. Mm. You know? So a couple of things I want to explore next. One is why you got into the military in the first place. And then so the, question. the second is how you sort of yeah. traversed out of it and mm. re redefined yourself. Because um, I think the whole redefining yourself, I think is huge mm. at the moment. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm writing four books at the moment and one of them wow. is with Gerald Ratner and yeah. it's called Reinventing Yourself. Yeah. And he had like the biggest PR gaffe in history, mm. lost everything. Yeah. And I think he's very qualified to talk about reinvention. But we live longer, everyone has a lot more jobs mm. now, job security is not, yeah. not, so I think this whole, how do you reinvent yourself and keep redefining who you are so that you don't become extinct, I think that's a, a, yeah. a really great thing, so mm. if, or something to discuss. So if we could go to that first, how did you reinvent yourself and traverse from mm. the military to what is now an amazing career in TV and, you know, I, you probably won't like this word, but you know, a bit of a celebrity. That's yeah. And I know there's a few ex-militaries that are well known. Mm -hmm. I, I met and inter interviewed David Goggins last week. Yeah. But there must be a load who aren't either. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did you make that the transition? Change? Yeah, yeah. Transition. Well, I mean, it's been a long process for me, and I've probably done it the again. I've done it the, probably the hardest way around because it's been a ten year. Well, even more than that. I left the military in 2000, um, and. You know, the, the reason I left the military is it, it wasn't, I didn't feel it was, it wasn't giving me, I didn't feel it was defining my purpose. I felt there was more, there was, I, was, I just wasn't happy. Mm. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people will stay so unhappy for a long time and just, just carry on that discomfort. And that's the whole concept of Breakpoint, the book, that's the whole concept of my company, Breakpoint. It's about taking that decision to go into the discomfort for the short term, for the long term gain. Yeah. But there's so many people that are prepared to just stick in that perceived comfort zone. There's mm. no comfort there. There's yeah. no growth. There's no comfort. So for me, when you're not comfortable, when you're not happy, when you're not fulfilled, you've got to look to change. You know, it's like for me in business as well, you know, things weren't working for us down south, having the business down there. And the only option was, as soon as we made the decision to actually relocate to a different location, everything, the world opened up, mm. opportunities opened up. And I think once you, you have to know that you have to look to change. You can't just sit there and try and make, when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. Start looking to the left and right. How so, do you know the difference between a little bit of an resistance yeah. and a problem yeah. that I've got to change? Yeah, I think it's when it come, becomes consistent, you know, right. the, the barriers keep on coming. You know, for us, for me personally, I mean, you know, recently with the business, you know, we're looking for premises. Every every road, you know, every sort of uh, avenue we went down, it was it was you know, it was a dead end. Nothing happened. So I think when it becomes consistent, you you then should start looking. But it's a very good question because it's not as if oh I've hit a speed bump, I need to sort of change direction yeah. because you know every everything's you know success is an obstacle. You know, it's you know have it, it, you have to you have to go through the obstacles, but. 
when it's consistent, you have to then really start to think, you know, this is not working. Where, you know, where else can, you know, what, what needs to change? Mm. But people, I mean, and that, I mean, I don't know if you've read the book, but the book in there, I mean, when I, I got attacked by a chimp at 10 years old, and I was sat under that chimp and I was about to die, and I knew that I could have stayed there in that, you know, the, the, the obvious thing to do was just to stay there and just to hope it didn't kill me. But I knew if I didn't do something, it was going to kill me. Now, if I did something, it would have made that situation a lot worse because I'm, I'm retaliating, you know, I'm attacking, basically attacking this crazed animal or retaliating against it. But I had to do that for any chance of living that day. And I made that decision and I, I, I managed to get the monkey off and managed to get away from it. Now, How did you get it off? I just managed to move my body to, to the left and right, lodged it up, lodged, dislodged it, and I just get my knee up to my chest and I smashed it in the chest mm. and then the monkey fell off. Yeah. Um, and then it was caught by a chain, it couldn't get to me. Mm. Um, but the thing is, people will stay under the monkey for the rest of their lives. Yeah. You know, and that, that, that taught me a lesson from a young age. So for me, leaving the military um, was about, you know, it just something wasn't right. I, I thought joining the military why did you join? Yeah, well, that was the thing. I thought, you know, I read Combat and Survival. It was a magazine you used to get every couple of weeks. And I was in love with the whole dream. My grandfather was in the military. Um, I thought it was a natural thing. to, And it excited me, the whole thing. It gave me such an extreme purpose, you know, a real purpose in life. And um, so that for me, it was just, it, it ticked all the boxes for me. But mm. the my perception was, was not the reality. Mm. And that's why I kept trying to step up the mark in the military, you know, I went from the Royal Marines and then I was going to leave and then I went to Special Forces and then I got there and I thought, well, this isn't doing it either. So, you know, with that discomfort, with that, there was no satisfaction, shall I say, with it. It was for, time for me to change. Yeah. And that was a change, you know, leaving. And then my perception of civilian life was, with the reality was so different, mm. so different. Because, um, you know, like I said before, you think you're invincible. Um, you know, I thought I was going to take the world down and it didn't have the world took me down. Mm. Um, so, but I think, you know, for me, I, I then wanted to, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a really crazy journey of, of leaving the military. I did some work in London. I tried to find some balance in my life. My ex-wife told me you aren't going anywhere. And that was like a red flag to a ball, mm. especially with she my- She probably did you a favour then. She did me yeah. a favour, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, as soon as that, you know, and I was, I was looking for the first avenue to get out of there and that's when the Iraq war, um, kicked off or, you know, the apparent sort of invasion of Iraq and everyone thought the war was over and inadvertently it just begun. Um, so, you know, this, there was fool's gold to be made over there in, in Iraq and I call it fool's gold because you get paid a fortune, but you, when, once you've done that line of work, you understand why. What did you do in Iraq? Um, for want of a better word, I mean, I was a country manager for a company. We set up a company. We were doing major infrastructure projects. When I first got there, I worked for ABC News, so I was looking after the journalists um, for, for a short period of time. Um, and then I moved to another company that some friends had set up that I used to serve with. And we were doing, we did the first mobile phone network in Baghdad. We basically hired, we recruited an army of 2,000 Iraqis, locals. Wow. We lived in the red zone, so that's actually with the locals, not in the green zone, which is all the safe area. Um, and we basically, we, we hit, the way the concept of ops was, was, was brilliant and it worked well, the fat, small management team, low profile, and then use the local forces to do all the work, you know, put, put some money back into the economy. Um, so it was working well. Um, so, and then we did that for six years. Um, doing various projects, we put the we put the electric power grid back in, but we did the full turnkey operation from logistics, security, everything, everything. There's no job too small, um, but it was a massive operation. And a lot of stuff happened over there. Like, um, well, I mean, my first when I was working for the ABC News, I got attacked at 140 k's an hour. I was doing, I got attacked by the militia. Um, I, I was looking after 12 people at the time, and I was, there was only me and one other. I had three vehicles in front of us, four, four people in each car. And, um, and yeah, it's a quiet night on the road. It was this perceived um, secure Iraq. You know, it's, it's, you know the, the statue had come down in Ferdos Square. And um, yeah, it was a perceived sort of safety. And um, 
I saw a car coming up in the rearview mirror, which then they started to um, put the rounds down on us. So I, I basically swerved the car into the central lane, managed to get them boxed in and opened fire on them, managed to close them down. But um, so there was that went on. Um, but then from that moment on, I mean, and that's the point, you know, I was, I was still in that sort of despair. That's Why all. fool's gold? You said earlier, fool's, fool's gold. gold because yeah. it's you, you, because your life, you know, it's six weeks on, six weeks off. You're in a war zone. You, you're probably going to lose your life. Possibly you could lose a limb. There's no insurance. You know, there wasn't proper insurance at that time. So if you lost, I mean, we had a bullet each and it was if any of us got bombed or shot or, you know, it looked like we were, we were going to be crippled for the rest of our lives, then we'd shoot each other. Yeah. And that's the way we operated because the, there was no insurance. Um, and it's just that life, you know, when I look back and everyone gets pulled over, you know, it was 13,000 a month for me going to the military, 13,000, I mean, for anyone, 13 grand a month tax free is massive, you know, for me as a kid, which I still, you know, was 32 at the time, um, I call it a kid, but, um, you know, it's, you're drawn in by the cash, the cash, the cash and, yeah. and then you understand, you know, I mean, after six years of living in a war zone, being attacked on a daily basis, that attacking rack where everything came down on me in a heartbeat. And that was the first time in my life where I, had, I couldn't call in air support. I couldn't call in naval gunfire. I had nothing but the responsibility of 12 people in front of me. And that was overwhelming. And mm. I had to snap myself out of that. Yeah. Otherwise I'd have, I'd have frozen and probably not be here today. Mm. But, um, so it's all those things. It's the fact that you're drawn by the money, but you know, it's the money's, Money should always be a byproduct of the passion for something you're doing. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't, you should never be drawn by the money, but that's why I call it fool's gold. You know, if you're drawn for the money, yeah. um, especially in that line of work, you know, and the risks and the, the balance of life. I mean, I used to come back home after that six weeks off and I was an absolute mess, Yeah. you know, and then you go back. But then there was, it's was, it was quite a kind of a contradictory really, because I, there, was, there was, I call it peace in war. You know, I used to get home, I couldn't wait to get back to Baghdad. You know, because it's black and white over there. You know, people want to kill you, fine, but you'll kill them if, if you get the upper hand. Um, but it was black and white. There was no white noise going on. You know, you come back to civilian life and it's the same when you leave the military and there's, you know, your girlfriend or your wife's talking about someone's parked over your driveway or the neighbors, mm. you know, there's, there's a tree overhanging. You go, like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that must be a complete yeah, culture shock. Yeah. It's absolutely, it's horrendous. And you're like, you just can't handle it. And still now I can't handle that small stuff. Yeah. I've got, I'm a lot more tolerant to it, but I can't handle the small stuff. It's just Because like, what have you, because of what you're seeing and you know what's yeah, important in life, I guess. It's just when the more people are in this sort of um, sheltered society, they become micromanagers of their own lives and other people's. And you're focusing on many little problems that really don't mm, make a first difference. world problems. Yeah. yeah, and it's you know, people focusing on you know that someone's tree overhanging. Yeah. Like, you've got too much time on your hands. It's the same in business, isn't it? You know, I get a lot of people that work for me going, "Oh, have you seen what such and such is doing?" I'm like, "I don't give a shit yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Focus on what we're doing." Mm. You know what I mean? We should we should be too busy to focus on them. Yeah. So, but people get bogged down with with the minuscule little things in life. Mm. Um, yeah, but fool's gold, you know, it's the fact that, that that job is not, Yeah. you know, going to a war zone, being drawn by the money, mm. you know, it's, it's not, um, not productive. Mm. Yeah. And then how did you traverse from there into your most recent career, obviously, big yeah. TV show, I'd love to know how you landed that, because yeah. there must have been many other good candidates as well. Mm. Um, and then obviously that makes you big. You write your books. You've got 200,000 yeah. followers on Instagram, which is epic. Mm. How did you move into that world? Yeah, see, that was, um, I can remember I was out in, I mean, throughout my military, all the stuff, I'd actually moved out to Australia from Baghdad. So I was commuting from Baghdad to Australia. Horrendous as well. Um, commuting, commuting and getting on the train. <laughs> <laughs> on the tube. <Yeah. laughs> Um, so that every six weeks, that was a, that was a big hell. toll, you yeah. know, it's like 24 hours traveling at yeah. least. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that came to an end because it was just too much in the end. Friends were starting to get killed and stuff. And it was mm. just, uh, it was, it was, it was not doing my mental state any good. So then I went, I, I needed to get out. So I try, I've always tried to redefine myself, mm. you know, and I try and redefine myself in the right. I've got to get a normal job. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what, you know, what is a normal job, you know. So, Just not in the military. Yeah, not in yeah. the military, not in a war zone. Yeah. So, you know, I came out with this, you know, trying to get into real estate and I was doing some real estate, selling properties and this, that and the other, everything was fine. 
but it wasn't, I still wasn't fulfilling that purpose. And then, so then I then got an opportunity to go out to Southeast Asia and um, for an organization, a charity organization, which I self-funded. And it was basically, I was basically busting kids out of child prostitution and slavery um, wow. uh, rackets or um, over in Southeast Asia. And that ended abruptly um, through a political mayhem situation. We had to escape out of Thailand. And then after that, I went, right, I've got to get a top job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got to get something, and I managed to land this amazing job in oil and gas. You yeah. know, and I had this. It was, it was super well paid, and it was in Brisbane, and it was you know it, it was amazing. And you know from the outside looking in, yeah. um, I was in the box, sat in a box, and doing this job, and I was it was just eating at me all day yeah. long. I was working out four times a day just to get out of the office. Right, I was fit, fitter than I've ever been in my life, <laughs> yeah. absolutely, and. Yeah. Um, and I managed to hold that down for two years, and I don't know how that happened, but um, because I was never in the office. Yeah. Um, so the point came, you know, that, that that contract was coming to an end, and again, this was this was a, another crossroads in my life. It was that time where, you know, someone else had offered me a contract within the same company and in a different department, and it just wasn't working out. You know, yeah. something would block it, and then everything was telling me change needs mm. to happen, you know, and that's why I keep said before, it has to be something that's consistent. I yeah. had so many roadblocks, there was no other way to turn but to look somewhere else. Mm. Now at that point I said, and I'd always said that I would never go back to the UK, never, you know, because I kind of left the UK under a bit of a smokescreen, you know, divorce, I'd left my kid, my, my boy, um, broken marriage, all that kind of stuff. It was just trauma. Um, and I said, I'd never go back to the UK. And you know, just everything, just nothing was working. And I was sat in my flat there in Brisbane overlooking the river, beautiful, um, beautiful home. And I just thought, I woke up at three in the morning. It was a Thursday morning. I don't know the date, but it was a Thursday morning. And suddenly a thought came into my head and it was the concept of going back to the UK. And immediately I went, never. But then I started to open the gates of that opportunity. And as soon as I did, everything started opening up. You know, my, you know, j just the thoughts of going back, it just all started making sense to me. Um, so as an extremist I am, as I am, I just went, right, I'm doing it. I'd, sort, I'd put everything on, in my house on the, on the market, on Gumtree. I had people coming in outside the flat for two weeks, sold the lot. I was mm. out there by the 11th of July, 2014. Came back to the UK with the solemn purpose of starting my company, Breakpoint. Yeah. Um, and Breakpoint was, has been a passion of mine for about nine years now. But, um, you know, I can remember I was flying over with the, with the mining company. I was flying over Australia and I was looking out and I just saw sort of as one scenario, we do a lot of things at Breakpoint, but one scenario, I just thought how good it would be for... When I was working for that organisation, I have to say first, though, that gave me the idea. I never had one meeting in two years, one team meeting. The organisation was that big that they'd lost all kind of synergy within the, you know, the, there was no real management. It was like all the up, the people on the management positions were just running the payroll. Mm. I just couldn't believe an organization worked like that. So I had this vision, I had this dream that you can't militarize a corporate, you know, a, a corporate uh, entity, but you can, some of the things that we learned in the special forces, some of the processes, the mindset and the processes, if you put that into the corporate structure, and certainly the one I was working for, I think that would have a massive benefit. Yeah. And I also was flying over and I just, thought about, you know, getting these sort of civilians to do an escape and evasion over the land. And I just, I just visualized it. I like, yeah. see it all happening in my head. Um, and at that point, you know, I made that decision to go back and went back to the UK with the sole purpose of starting Breakpoint. Which does what, if you could summarize it? If I could summarize it in one word, it changed, well, not in one word, in one sentence, we change the way people think. Yeah. So basically we have a number of things. We use the military as a platform for sure, but we, we do, I believe that people can, you can think about changing, you can think about, a lot of people talk about, right, it's all in the mind, it's the mindset. What does that mean? What does that actually mean? Mm. What are you gonna do? What, how, how are you going to make someone believe that limitations can be broken? Yeah. So for instance, everything we do at Breakpoint, we, we do scenarios, etc. cetera. Um, we do a lot of mindset stuff in the, in the classroom, we do workshops, but if there's not a practical execution of the theory, mm. it doesn't change the blueprint. Right. So that's what Breakpoint does. We do yeah. a lot of sort of, we do a lot of workshops, especially for the corporates where we sit down and talk about mindset. 
And then we get them to plan their own operation. We then, we then get them to go out and do a mission. And it's not physically exerting, but what it is, we, we, we put people into, into scenarios where we apply pressure. And then we apply pressure, we apply more pressure and more pressure, and we teach them processes how right. to deal with that pressure. Um, so we should, we should have a bit of that, shouldn't we? You should. I reckon that'd be good. Yeah, we've got about um, 80 staff in one of our offices, I you think. You should come along. Yeah, because yeah. you just get stuck in your habits yeah. and... Yeah trenches of them. routine yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah being shaken up a bit I like the idea of that but the thing is that I, and that's the thing we break point we take people out of their comfort zones um, and that's again not by the physical it's not by the physical at all we do do those events for certain yeah. people but it's when you put people into unknown territory you give them tasks to do you put pressure on them they don't get the opportunity to pre-plan the perfect outcome yeah you know, as we do, mm. you know, so, so what happens then, they have to act on raw emotion. Yeah. So they dealt that, and that's why you see on the TV show and stuff, you see people crying because mm. they've actually faced a character for the first time. Yeah. They've never been put into that situation. So they've actually seen themselves for who they truly are. Mm. And you don't get that in a comfort zone. You get ego, you get everything else. Yeah. You get this perception of who you're supposed to be, which is not you. And you never get to the true character. And for an organization, you can never build camaraderie while there's ego smashing against each other right. all day long. And the only way you can do that is by taking people out of the comfort zones, get rid of ego mm. and allow them to, to bond. And yeah. that's the way you do that by putting them in uncomfortable situations. So in a sentence, sorry, I went. That's all right, no, go for it, it's all right. <laughs> and he's now turned into it's a sales fine. pitch. It's you mentioned yeah. <laughs> So, but that's basically what, and we have, we have mindset programs, we have fitness programs, we have nutrition programs. Yeah. Like a, um, we've got a program called Prime Evolution the prime being you evolution being your continuous evolution every day um, but the pinnacle or the, or the it's a triangle at the top of that triangle is the mindset program which is basically learned from my experience it's a 12 week program of basically how I get, how I get myself from a very you know negative mindset to, to one that's seems to be getting me places these mm. days so um and, and if you could summarize how you did that how did you get yourself from a negative mindset to a good one could, could well the way i did that? it i'll tell you exactly how yeah. to summarize it i mean again we're brought, brought up into this world aren't we we've got this creative beautiful mind you go to school they tear that away from you mm. you know and you're left with this programming that, which then exists and, and which we're left with as adult, adults now that's some that you know that causes subconscious um so, so your subconscious blueprint now, the only way I feel you can change that is by changing the blueprint in your subconscious, which will have a positive effect moving forward. So the way I did that, I actually wrote a contract to myself. Right. And I used to read that contract every day and it was, I, was, I was bound by that contract of how I would change yeah. and who the person I wanted to be. It had a date on there of what, how when I wanted, wanted to achieve it by. Um, and it was something I read every morning, every night. Yeah. I even went to the point of actually saying it in front of the mirror, which is really tough. Have you yeah. ever, I actually get people to do that now on the program. Yes, I, I have, have done it because I've read it a few times. Yeah. Dave, David Goggins talks yeah. about the accountability mirror. And yes, it's weird right, as hell. Yeah. Yeah. It is. But the thing is, if you can't tell yourself. I know, you're right. And you, get, can you, you face yourself. Yeah. yeah, you do. People like that are not doing that because we've yeah. got this thousand person audience around who's going, you're a dickhead. You're, yeah. You know, you look stupid. But there is no, no one cares. No. There's just you and your, you know, those internal messages. So for me, doing that, that really creates a massive, Yeah, it changes the blueprint. And you can't change your life unless you change the blueprint. Mm. And it's constantly, you know, they used to say 21 days, you know, yeah. it's, it's bull, that's bullshit. It's not 21 days to change your habit. It's probably 21 days to get into some kind of different um, discipline. Um, but it, it's around, you know, around about two months before you can actually change and, and notice a notable difference. Yeah. So for me, it was like, you have so to, consistency. It was consistency. Yeah. It was going into process because if, yeah. you, if you rely on emotion and that's why we talk so much and why the military is so good in planning things because it's process. Mm. It doesn't care about your emotions. It says you have to do this and then you have to do that and then you have to do that. But yeah. if you don't have that and you rely on emotion, you've got everything going on in your head. You've got your personal life, the whole lot. You never achieve anything. No. And that's why goal setting, planning is so important and following process. It's like me going out for a run. A lot of, a lot of people say, oh, Ollie, you know, he just loves it. He must get up in the morning and he must like, 
go running from his trainers on still he slept in them. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean open the window and dive straight yeah. out and straight up the hills it's not like that I, right. I have the same negativity as everyone else but mm. I know I understand what's going on now because I'm an observer of my emotions yeah. as opposed to a victim right and that's massive yeah. what you just said there yeah. it's huge yeah because yeah being able to say oh look what I'm thinking and feeling there exactly and not necessarily trusting it as who you are yeah just how you feel in the moment mm. um you talked about ego before. I'd love to jump yeah. in there if that's all right. So, um, you know, you were talking about there's no camaraderie when egos are clashing. Mm. I mean, in the military, there must be some strong egos. There must be. Yeah. Um, how do you, and having observed other people, try and manage your own ego? I think the Special Forces selection has a very um, thorough... That's what, that's what sele the selection process delivers. It basically delivers people that are emotional chameleons. So basically they can adapt, you know, they understand their emotions. They know what's going on. They can tell, like I said before, I do believe every special forces soldier is the ability to observe his emotions. Right. So they're looking at that before they even yeah. get in the process. And then yeah. it's like me now, I can go, whoa, that's ego. And I know it's going on. Yeah. I, you know, it's a lot of the times I'm going, oh, that's ego. It's like a walk down the street. And I start thinking, I wonder if anyone's going to notice me. Yeah. And I go, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's pathetic. Yeah. It's so pathetic. But that is ego. Yeah. It, but I know to cut it off. Mm. You know, I, but unless you, unless you know that process, it, it becomes a problem. And that's, yeah. the people don't understand it. They just think it's them. It's not, it's their ego and, you know, flaring up. But basically, mm. special forces soldiers, I believe, have got that ability to be able to observe when these things are happening. They can be able to control their emotions. And especially when it comes to ego, they can chop it off straight away and go, whoa, push that back. Yeah. That's affecting my decision. You know, mm. I mean, you imagine like a special forces soldier in a situation when he's undercover in a, in a bar, let's say Northern Ireland, for instance. He's undercover. He's got his eyes on the target. Someone wants to come up in a bar and fight him. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, and starts, you know, questioning his, his, his toughness. Yeah. You know, what does he do? Does he stand there and have a toe-to-toe -to -toe and no. knock him out? Yeah. No, he doesn't, does he? He goes, sorry, mate. You know, and he walks away from it. Yeah. And a lot of the times, you know, a lot of people in the Special Forces, you walk into a bar, you'd never see him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Your perception, people's perception of who a Special Forces soldier is, is so different to what they actually are, in the UK anyway, yeah. I tell you that. So I really think that, you know, it's just having that ability to be able to chop, observe, you know, stop that emotion. Yeah. And that's with every emotion. Every emotion is contagious. I actually think that's life mastery. Yeah. Life mastery is being able to manage your emotions mm. by understanding what they are yeah. and what they're not. I feel like, for me, I can't speak for everyone, but I've seen it commonly. Um, often our emotions that come out yeah. are are our memory of previous painful situations coming into the present. Exactly. Because we were reminded in the present. Yeah. And so we're not reacting to the situation, we're reacting, reacting to the memory. Exactly, yeah. of when yeah. you got nearly killed by a chimp. Yeah. Or when someone embarrassed yeah. you so hard that yeah. you felt such strong shame. Yeah. And it took me a long time to work that out. Actually, it's not what that person said or did. Yeah. It's my reaction and perception of what they said 100%. based on my experience. And yeah. they probably didn't intend it. No. They don't want to take you back to when you were 10. They no. didn't even know they did it. Exactly. And yeah, that, that's got to be one of the hardest things in life to master. But it is. And that's Thank a mental water, thing. That's, that's a pleasure. Um, but it's the same thing with, you know, our, 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 our minds. So, you know, it's like it takes images. And it's got an image bank. Yeah. So when you go into a room, it's like you go into a room and... If you go to that room, I've done it a number of times, I'm sure we all have, you know, you go to meet someone in that room and usually they're sat somewhere and that one day they're not sat there, they're sat someone and you walk straight past them. Yeah. Because your mind is recalling that previous image. Mm. And I noticed it the other day, actually, when I was reading a book. And I don't know about you, but I, when I read a book, my first paragraph is crisp. You yeah. know, I was doing an audio stuff the other mm. day. But then what happened, I was noticing, uh, the further I got into the script, and yeah, you can have to be a bit bored of it or whatever, but the further you get in, I was trying to predict what it was going to say. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. Instead of the first one, it's clean. You know, you're not predicting because it's new. But then yeah. the further I got into it, I was starting to mess up more because I was trying to predict the text yeah. from what I'd already said. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I think yeah. that, you know, it's the same thing. It's, you know, your, your brain is full of images. It tries to fit every new situation to an old situation. Yeah. And I think when people actually understand, people, I, I feel so, um, so, so sorry for people that go through their lives and don't understand all this. Yeah. Because they don't live their life to the full. And, you know, they go to the graves is probably very disappointed and um, 
you know, live a life mm. quite meaningless. Mm. But um, I don't mean to sound like <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just think, you know, the sooner people actually realise how we work as humans, yeah. I think that's massive. You know, we, we're born, we get into these bodies and then we like jump in and we're like that. Right. Where are we going? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We think yeah. we're fucking experts, mm. but we're not. Mm. We're not, you know, and we don't understand. We think we, think we you know, we, we think we know everything, we can do everything. We yeah. don't actually pay any attention to how the system works. And I think once you do that and you understand how we work, how you can observe your emotions and everything else, it's a massive benefit, mm. you know, yourself. Yeah, I mean, the first 26 years of my life, until I listened to an audio program called by Tony Robbins called Awaken the Giant Within, which was a random luck, but I listened to that. I thought, oh, I'm born how I am. I'm good at what I'm good at. I'm not good at what I'm not good at. I'll never be good at what I'm not good at. I'm just lucky to be good at what I'm good at. They're better than me at everything. Yeah. I'm no good at that. I can never get good at that. They're lucky because they were born and they can do that. Mm. This is how the world is. D don't tell yeah. me how it is because this is how the world is. I'm yeah. right, you're wrong. And I lived 26 years of my life in this very one-dimensional yeah myopic view of the world yeah and basically i was living hypnotized yeah not understanding everyone in a different reality not understanding yeah. i could get as good at you as things if yeah. you teach me yeah. not understanding that you weren't born to be strong and fit yeah. and that you did you trained yeah yeah and, and i do think i think that's kind of what you're saying in a way a lot of people live hypnotized and then they mm. die yeah and the greatest gift you can give yourself is to step back and become aware and that's what I did. And that's, you know, going back to the question, because I didn't even answer the question. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Conversation, <laughs> not interview. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's what I did. And that's how it all changed for me. You know, when I came back to the UK, I, you know, I managed to sort of get my drinking under control. You know, I, I trained so hard in the week and then I just go on a bender all weekend, Oof. but, you know, and then back on Monday. Um, but I then got back to the UK and, uh, you know, it's, I, started understanding how much, you know, I, I was questioning all the time, who's this other person? You know, who's this other person, the ego or whatever, mm. you know, I just couldn't, and I tried to figure out, you know, and how did I come from being like, going through the world's hardest training and being one of the few, you know, a special forces operated to being this weak, broken character. Mm. You know, I just couldn't understand. So I, I kind of, um, and that's when I started looking at, you know, we look externally every, for everything, don't we? We yeah. look externally for that fix. And I spent 10 years of my life after leaving the military, going to war zones, going here, going there, using alcohol, finding this external fix, trying to find the happiness. And it's not there. We're looking mm. in the wrong place. And yeah. it wasn't until I just started looking within that I started to find that happiness. And how, what was it inside that found you that happiness? I just felt that, pay, you know, investing in yourself it was therapy to me. Mm. You know, I started investing, I started meditating, I started, when I came back, I, I came with the sole intention of starting Breakpoint. Yeah. And I went to do some, I was doing some work around London actually chasing some nasty Russians um, on these surveillance jobs, which, yeah. So it wasn't, it, again, it wasn't defined, it wasn't defining my purpose. And I knew that by doing that, it was, I was gonna get lost in, you know, I'd start earning decent money again. Mm. And before you know it, you're too busy earning a living to actually doing your, you know, what you're passionate about. And then, then I decided to cut that away. That's the day. I'm going back to one of your other questions now. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to hit every it's, one of your questions. Good. By the way, um, we haven't even asked one of these. So it's all good. <laughs> it's just, we're just chatting. Yeah, carry on. So, um, yeah, I came back to the UK and then, um, and that's the day after I left that job is the day I bumped into Foxy again. Right. Which, um, I'd not seen him for 13 years. Yeah. 13, it could have been 16, I don't know, it was a long time. And um, yeah, it was awesome to see him. Mm. And I went and met Foxy. We met at Beaconsfield Services on the M40. Um, I walked in there and he was on his phone. He's still to this day on his phone. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not changed. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and, and we went off to a hotel. <laughs> don't cut there. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and we just said, let's get on it. Let's get on the lash. Let's have a drink. Let's talk about, you know, where we've been for the last 16 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, we had a, had a great time and we talked about Breakpoint, you know, we talked about the ideas and he was like, oh, I've, I've wanted to do the same, you know, it resonated with him. Yeah. Totally resonated. I, was, I didn't want to go back to a war zone. I managed to keep my arms and legs where they were, which yeah. is great. Um, some of my friends haven't. Mm. Um, and, um, and that's where the concept sort of started growing from there. And, yeah. and from that point, I went, I am not working for anyone else. Yeah. I'm going to exhaust everything to make this dream work. Mm. Um, 
and from that point on, luckily for me, my brother had, he's, he's a pilot, um, he used to be a pilot in the Navy. He, I phoned up and said, look, I'm coming home. And he's like, ah, I'm leaving. So he was on his way over to Malaysia to work for Shell yeah. as an SE rescue pilot. But the good thing for me in the silver lining was the fact that there was a house free mm. for me down in Cornwall, which was right. perfect. So basically I went down there. I've been away for years and years and years. I couldn't even get a credit card in the UK. Mm. It was hilarious. So, um, you know, I had no credit rating, no nothing. I actually had to get a credit card through my mum. I was 43 years old. Things were going good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Living the dream. Living yeah. the dream. But that's the thing as well, you know, you can get sucked into the fact, oh, I'm 43, you know, yeah. I haven't got a house, I haven't got a And before you know it, you're in a world of, you know, depression yeah. and because you think you're not achieving because you're not keeping up with the Joneses. Mm. But once you, you know, I just thought, right, well, I'm doing what I need to survive. Am. This yeah. is where I am and that's yeah. it. It was hilarious because my brother was like, because um, I was doing the spy, you know, like doing the surveillance jobs in London and stuff. And uh, I was talking to my brother and I was like, Jack, can you lend us some money? I need to start this company called Break. You know, blah, blah, blah. he says, mate, he says, you make me laugh. He says, you like that bloke born. You know, born yeah, yeah, says, yeah. but you're broke born. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Living in my mum, in, yeah. in my brother's house, credit card off my mum. And, um, but he lent me the cash, thank mm. God. That's why he's getting the watch. Right, nice. Um, but um, yeah, and it was from that moment on, I couldn't get anything. So I thought, I, I got attacked in Iraq, right? It's in the book, it's detailed in the book. It's, it was a, an epiphany for me. I predicted everything that would happen that day because mm. I visualized it. I, I visualized I wanted to get attacked. Wow. Why? Because it was going to win us the contract. Right. And it was the only way we had to justify, because security, um, it's a cost to a business. It's not an asset. Yeah. It's only ever a value when it's exercised. Yeah. So we were going to lose all our jobs. And I said to the boys, the only way we're going to keep this job is if we get attacked. I was going to pick up the guy that was going to make the decisions. It was, and um, I said, well, we've got the guy with us. What we need to happen is we need to get attacked. Right, to show your value. To show our value. Yeah. I didn't actually believe that this visualization stuff actually worked. I knew that in the past, yeah. to pass special forces selection, I dreamt about the outcome, visualized the mm. outcome, forgot the journey, because the journey is the journey, but yeah. that is where the growth is, um, but visualized on the outcome. And I just thought, I'm gonna put all my energy into that. And I yeah. did exactly the same with this process. I thought, this is how it's gonna happen. And I detailed timings, I detailed what would actually happen, the specifics, everything. Even detailed getting back to the location in Iraq, and tasting the champagne that was given to me mm. and the guy signing the contract in front of me. Mm. Visualized it all beforehand, never believed it would actually happen. Yeah. And it happened exactly wow. that way. And that for me was an epiphany. It was like this, it was almost like a message from the universe saying, yeah. this stuff works, it does I'm gonna work. show you how this yeah. works. Yeah. And it was an epiphany. I, and from that moment, I then used that. When I got back to the UK, I said, I'm gonna do exactly that same thing, that same process. And I locked myself in that house for two months. And I had, it was a boot camp. It was a mental boot camp. I used to do the same things, process driven every day, yeah. out of bed, meditation. I had all my list. I had a, a, a clock wheel I'd done around the CD, put lines all the way through it of everything I wanted to achieve. I yeah. still got it. And within eight, nine months, I achieved everything on that list. Wow. So, you know, anyone that says to me that visualization, positive thought, all that kind of thing doesn't work, fair enough, keep living the way you're living. Yeah. But you'll never change my view of it. Mm. I, think you, I think everyone who doesn't see that way is, is missing out. Yeah. And a lot of people say, oh look, this is hocus pocus, it's a load of rubbish. But all you're doing, for me anyway, you're planting something in the, in the subconscious yeah. that basically means you will make decisions based on your yeah. subconscious thoughts. It's just like tuning into a frequency. Exactly, um, yeah. Because I've thought about this a lot, and at some yeah. points I think, wow, it's very profound. You know, you've got the unified field, you've got all of these simultaneous, infinite things that could happen at any yeah. one point. But then on the other side of it, I just think it's common sense. Yeah. Negative people walking around in a coma attract all negative stuff. Yeah. Positive people who are happy and radiant and give energy out attract it back because we're attracted to the same energy. Yeah. So it's, I think it's just natural. What you put out, you get back. Yeah. For me, it's common sense as it well. It is common sense. Yeah. But the thing is, we, we, everyone's so brainwashed. I mean, the last thing society wants is everyone to be creative of course. and positive because yeah. that, they can't control that. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they need to control the fear, sort of a fear-driven, you know, society, systemized society. Mm. Um, but 
so for me, that that just you know, it's, it's just obvious. It's yeah. just, but when a lot of people I speak to, you just sort of laugh and go, "Do mm. you really believe that works?" And I'm like, ah, "I'm living proof." Yeah, you know, I nearly killed myself <laughs> through mm. it. Yeah, yeah. But you know, and, and so basically, I mean, I use that process mm. uh, for everything I did from that point. But I, I believe we are that way. We're, that, we, we're negatively geared that way. There's no for human evolution. There's actually no benefits being positive. No. It's all get, about get, get you killed. Well, you get just killed. like that. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, this would be right. Bang. Yeah. Gone. Exactly. Yeah. But being negative, you're looking out for that saber tooth mm. tiger. You're looking out for danger here, there, and everywhere. And that's the way we program. That's the survival blueprint. Yeah. Um, so I mean, uh, you so know, I guess then sorry to jump in, but I guess yeah. life mastery then is knowing when there's clear and present danger and letting that survival mechanism kick in. Yeah. And then. The 99 other times out of 100 when just because someone looked at you or someone cut you up in the car and then that survival yeah. mechanism kicks in understanding actually that's not the pattern i need to play right now yeah i suppose that knowing the difference between the two because anything that happens that challenges your mm. survival and in modern times that can be embarrassment public speech yeah you know whatever actually understanding well actually i'm not in danger my body just thinks yeah. it's in danger but it's the thing you know it's like a lot thanks for sharing you know, in your mind, thanks for sharing. Yeah. But it's not me. Yeah, thanks now. for the feedback, but we're off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've, been, I've, said, I've actually, you know, physically said it to myself, fuck off into the corner. Yeah. You are yeah. not needed right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's not, it's not all about just survival and being killed and stuff like that. Mm. But as as humans, you know, procreation, everything else, we want to be liked. So, yeah. you know, the, that whole system works. Like you just said, public speaking, you, you fear of not being liked. People might not like me because they might not like what I say. Mm. And that's the whole defense. You know, it's through every stream. It's not just through survival. It's not just through being killed. Yeah. You know, so, but I, th I think it's once, you know, and when I started doing, I mean, I had some horrendous public speaking events. <laughs> I can know? imagine, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, as, as everyone does, yeah. you know, it's like, and compared to now, I mean, obviously you can't shut me up, but, uh, mm. <laughs> but you know, when I look back to some of the things, you know, I think I've still got PTSD from some of those <laughs> yeah. events. Yeah. But, um, but now, you know, but even, even back then, I would visualize the end goal, yeah. which was everyone being, you know, yeah. brilliant. And I wouldn't worry about the rest. Yeah. That was the vision. Yeah. You know? So for me in that room and starting break point, um, was, was in that house mm. you know, and everything but it was getting to the point you know it was two months in my family were on to me my family someone in my family that doesn't you know my, my um, uh, one of my family members invited me around and it was like for a meal one night I was like this is a bit odd and they, they invited me around to, to convince me not to do this business right oh, you should do the conventional thing you know yeah. you, should, you guys go into security you go out to a route you, mm. you know sort of a, a, a security business and all that. I was like I don't want to do that, mm. you know, and, and try to basically just quash everything. Yeah. You know, I'd, sometimes they say because they care though, don't they? They're do. not always yeah. trying to bring yeah. you down. And that's, that's the, it's, a, it's a fine line because the thing is with us, those closest to us, we listen to the most, yeah. you know, because we love them, we trust them and they're doing the same thing. They love and trust you. They don't want you to fail. But, you know, when you're stepping outside the parameters of normality, mm. they're the ones trying to pull you in and get you back on that. But yeah. for me, you know, it's like, you know, and even my mum was saying at the time, look, mate, you might have to, you know, think about getting it. I was running out of cash, you know, money's, yeah. you know, starting a business is, you know. Yeah. Um, and I was just thinking, you know, even though, and I was getting things up and running, doing a little bit of work here and there. And, um, you know, I got the website um, started. And um, just as I was starting to doubt this thing, I think the thing in Iraq was probably a load of bullshit. You know, you, it was hocus pocus and all this, that and the other. And thinking, mm, you know, no money in the bank, the phone rang. And it was Foxy saying, look, the thing that we st talked about for Breakpoint, would you want to do that on, sh on a TV show? And for me, that wanted exposure, but didn't have that avenue to exposure. That was like, a, that was the, the gift from the gods. That was yeah. worth the two months of the solid boot camp of me going through all that, you know, process that delivered in a, in a heartbeat. And I was like, that, are you drunk, Foxy? <laughs> yeah. Are you drunk? Are you in the yeah. bar? And he says, no. And he put me straight into the production company and it all started from there. So did they reach out to him or did he see? No, they reached out? out to Foxy and, and you asked the question, you, you mentioned something before because there, there must have been a lot of, and I'd even say more suitable candidates. You know, there's always someone better than you. There's right. always someone that's done more. Um, but the thing is, there was at that time, you know, we're the first guys to be non-pixelated. We're the first guys to expose who we are on TV. How do you mean non-pixelated? Well, oh, as in you could yeah, see your you face. you could see a face. Right, yeah. We know our names, yeah. everything. We, we made that decision. Uh, that was our choice. Um, so when you asked, there must have been loads of people that wasn't. 
because people weren't prepared to take that step. Right. People weren't prepared. They knew that once you're on TV, you can go back to the old world. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that was gone. And why were you prepared to take that step? When First that of all, because the break point. Break point and what I needed was exposure. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be in the security world. I didn't want to do the things that we normally should do. Mm. Um, so for me, it was just a dream. You know, it's that exposure and same for Foxy. Yeah. You know, it was just a dream to get that going. So, mm. um, you know, we put our hands up straight away. Um, yeah. But the people that didn't were like, no, you know, they didn't see the bigger picture. And yeah. to be quite honest, at that time, I didn't see the bigger picture of like, now into the fourth series of SAS, you know, and starting to film the fifth series. You know, yeah. I didn't see that back then, but I knew that was my platform to start the business. And when it comes to the TV stuff and everything for me, that's secondary to my business. Yeah. That fuels my business. You know, and that mm. is my, my one so sole it's, it's marketing then really for it you, is marketing. Is it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm not chasing op other opportunities in TV. I just haven't got time anyway with the business. But the whole fact is that that is a tool for my exposure mm. for the business. And Do you enjoy doing it? The show? Yeah. I love doing the show. And it's great to be back with the lads. It's great to actually, it is awesome, you know, when you're back with the well-trained team and you know that, you know, it's, it's like how people around you that know when it comes to delegation, you can just hand stuff off yeah. and stuff gets done or solutions get found. So it's brilliant to be back with the guys, you know, yeah. know, you know to come up with the very, you know, some very creative ideas and solutions. It's brilliant, but it's hard work. Yeah. It's, it's really, and I want to say there's not, there's not a but to that. It's hard work. Yeah. And it's hard work. And it's yeah. hard work. You know, it's hard, uh, uh, you know, you, you sometimes you get less sleep than the recruits on the show. Mm. You know, we always, the, it's so dynamic that show, we're changing, it's, ne it's not a formatted script as such. You know, we've got stuff we need to do, but we have to chop and change and steer it in a manner that suits the candidates. Yeah. So, but yeah, the, the simple answer is, yeah, and, I love doing it. And that's, has that been huge for your exposure and your brand? Massive. Yeah. Massive. And I, I'm not saying, I mean, I would still be pushing forward with Breakpoint regardless, yeah. but I just think we'd have been a long way back if we didn't have that TV show. Mm. And the exposure, for me, I mean, it's something, you know, we came from the shadows into the spotlight. It's very hard for people like us. And for yeah. me, the first series was so clunky. You know, I just couldn't get into it because I didn't understand the purpose of the show. And I just thought, but once I understood the purpose of the show and the fact that Foxy went on the first series, he started talking about that he had PTSD, he was thrown out of the military because of it. And the effect that had across the UK was a phenomenal. It was a, it was a ripple across the whole of the UK from people just supporting people that had were suffering. It was amazing, and that's when I understood un, understood the power of that TV show. Yeah. So for me, that gave it massive purpose, and for me, the exposure to me more purposefully, more purposefully for me is how can I use that exposure for other, for others? Yeah. It's not about my ego. How can I use it to a positive benefit for other people? Mm. It's so like my company, the, um, my mission statement is to create a globally, globally identified brand recognized for the positive growth and development of others. And I feel that show does, aside from Breakpoint, the show does that. It inspires people. It's absolutely, it's a powerhouse. Great. And then your book, Breakpoint. Yeah. Um, what was the purpose of writing that? The purpose of that, of writing the book, was, was basically for that very reason. You know, the... Um, I feel that I've learned some harsh lessons in my life, um, quite, some quite bizarre and harsh lessons. Um, but a lot of people feel, and the, the book, as, as many people know, is raw. You know, it's, it's no holds barred. It's, I'm, I fully expose everything that I've been through. Um, and I feel it's good for people to understand because people put us on a pedestal and say, well, they're, they're cut from a different cloth. It's bullshit. Yeah. You're not cut from a different cloth. It's just that we've chosen to do, we, we do um, extraordinary things. Uh, what's the, what, what's the, I'm saying that wrong. We do, we're ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Yeah. So, and everyone's got the ability to do that. Mm. And my purpose is to allow people to understand and the purpose of the book, that we all have a beautiful gift. Yeah. But the thing, and we're all using it as well. But the thing is people are using it in that negative mindset, mm. you know, that sort of mega, they're, they're not using it to the best of their ability. We go to the gym, we work on how good we look from the outside in, but the best muscle you can train is this. Yeah. And when people understand that, that creates opportunity, it creates everything, it creates peace, happiness, the whole lot. Yeah. And that's where we should focus. The way you look is a byproduct. Yeah. You know what I mean? It should, once you get the happiness here, then the rest follows. Mm. So the book really sort of defines that through some very convoluted kind of messages. Yeah. But you know, through my personal experience, 
and everything through the book. I've been in some shit situations, some very dodgy situations, and I've always found that silver lining. You need to hold on to that silver lining every time. You know, if you get lost in that um, downward slide of the neg- negativity of the situation, you become the situation. Yeah. And you need to get out of that. You know, you're a victim of your circumstances. You need to be able to pull yourself out mm. of that. The book defines methods and processes for doing that. Yeah. And hopefully everyone reading that, and I've already got the feedback of people that have read it, this book will give them the first, you know, yeah. make them take the first step. Mm. Great. So um, we'll let everyone know in a moment where yeah. they can get the book. Sure. Um, and I'll tell you what we'll do if it's all right with you. We'll maybe do a bit of a quick fire. Oof. Um, you, you don't have to answer them quickly, yeah. but we can. But before we do that, I've got a random one for you. Mm. Um, so Kieran is an ex-bodybuilding world champion. Um, you would never tell. No, no, it's, uh, no look at him. And um, I bet you're glad you're not live in this, man. No, I'm like, that's <laughs> and, um, and he's he heads up all of our social media. He basically has a dream job yeah. where he gets to meet cool people like yourself and travel and do cool stuff. Yeah. Um, and I want to beat him in a press-up competition. I yeah. am going to beat him in a press-up competition. I'm a bit of a dark horse. I can do strength-wise. I don't look very strong, but I yeah. can do some things really well. A lot of things really badly. And so we're having this discussion, how many press-ups is a lot of press-ups? And then we said, well, we should ask people who are in the military because you must have done loads. So in one set, yeah. what is a lot of press-ups? How many have you seen someone do in one set? Because I need to get to that number to beat him. And in six months, he's going to have forgotten all this. I'm just going to say, right, let's go. I'm going to beat him. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> the silent warrior. Yeah. How, I mean, well, to be honest, it depends how you do the press-up, press-ups because people do them wrong. So, yeah. I mean, if you do them properly, and I'm sure you know how to do them. So is that sort of quite right, narrow? Elbows in, not, yeah. not this kind of effect. Yeah. With your elbows in, uh, yeah. to be quite honest, I think fifty is a, you know is, is a good number to be really? able to do that. But if you can do a hundred, that's like a lot. That, is that's it? a lot. Yeah. So with your elbows in, about that far apart, shoulder width apart. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And it, the, the elbows come up the side like that, and they don't right. flare out. Yeah, yeah. Because I probably do flare out yeah. a bit. Because that's more of a tricep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, whereas right. you do the other ones, it's more chest, isn't it? More yeah. chest. But so that's that's kind of how you've got that to do a press. That's how you do it. Yeah, that's that's true. But the thing yeah. is, I mean, impressive is fifty, but between fifty and hundred is is very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But I, I think the the buying should be fifty. Yeah. yeah. Well, All right. Then noted. <laughs> yeah. Noted. Yeah. yeah. So I did. I was doing a fitness competition. I got up to ninety four. Wow. But I think I probably did. Yeah. What you said. Yeah. Because um, I mean, if someone was doing, you know, if someone was sort of. Um, um, being a striker, you know, you get no rep. Yeah, you know, and that's how you right. do it. Yeah, you know, so no you've, got, you've actually got to get the technique perfect. Yeah, the technique like, perfect yeah. and keep it there. It's yeah. like anything, isn't it? Pull ups, the whole lot. You know, yeah. you've got to get the. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So sorry, but sorry yeah, for that. Right. Right. And the che- and the what's it? What's it? The, the chest. The fist on the floor. Right. So don't. What, so you don't have to touch. You, the, you don't have to touch the floor. Yeah. You don't have to touch the floor. But, but you have to. Yeah. yeah. So if I got something. Yeah, like a that was that ball. high. Yeah. Tennis and ball. then make sure you touch. Yeah. Yeah. This has just gone serious, right. mate. This has gone serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mate, I'll look at, I'll see you in six months. Yeah. Like, well, I like the idea. Give me some protein. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of looking skinny, having a bit of a gut, and just yeah, yeah. beating people <laughs> like you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, quick fire round then. Sure. Um, is your real name Ollie Ollerton? It's, um, no. No, it's not. It's Matthew yeah. Ollerton. Um, and why did you change your... I, I, it was like I inherited it from school. So right. Ollerton... Being yeah. a surname, you know, my brother's called Ollie, I'm called Ollie. Yeah. So, yeah, it's something, but I much prefer it than Matthew. Yeah, because yeah. I wonder, it sounds like quite a cool name if yeah. you wanted to be an author or on yeah. Ollie Ollerton. I wondered if you did it for that reason. No, no, uh, it's inherited from uh, from young. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So, um, there's the next two questions I think are shit questions. Yeah. But they often get really good answers. So, if right. you think they're shit, just fine. But, um, no, 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 but they do, they get really good <laughs> answers. But they're terrible questions. Right. Um, so, what's the best advice? you've ever received um the best advice i've ever, ever received was to um does this have to be a short answer no you can ask whatever you like oh the best uh, the best advice i ever received was from a guy called bagsy baker who was my officer from uh, desert storm mm. um who basically told me that if i left the military and didn't try for special forces then i would regret it for the rest of my life right and the fact was, he said that you should believe in yourself. Yeah. You need to believe in yourself. If, if it wasn't for those words, I wouldn't be sat here today. Yeah. I'm actually going to meet him oh, wow. for the first time tonight since nice. that meeting. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you basically... Could have a few drinks with him, right? Yeah, 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 possibly. Yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> possibly. I do drink now, yeah. by the way, but um, it, I'm in control. Yeah, now. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll meet Bagsy, Bagsy later. But uh, yeah, yeah that, that, that's, and I mentioned that in the book, you know, that was, if he, if he hadn't have said that to me, you wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have done it. And that yeah. was basically believing yourself mm. because you've got what it takes. Yeah. Great. And then what's the worst advice you've ever received? God. I had loads of bad advice. Do you know what I think the worst? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. No. No. Worst advice. I've got nothing. Someone said to me once, I don't remember bad advice, so next question. And I thought that was quite a good answer. Yeah, well, it is. And yeah. I, I just yeah, disregard just, that bad just advice. Push, yeah, it's push, gone. Push it out of their head. Yeah. Okay, is there anything, one thing that you think is really wrong with the world that you'd like to see changed or you'd like to change? Uh, yeah, I just think that um, a lot of the things we talked about today, a lot of the, you know, sort of the mental processes... Um, the mindset, I think we should be taught that from an early age. Mm. That should be a process at school. I really think, um, you know, we're, we're creating a society full of people that are, want to be systemized. You know, I talked about this the other week and I call it the, you know, people are on their LPS, the life positioning system. Yeah. It works exactly the same as the GPS. You know, it's like you get in your car mm. and you like, although you sort of should, if you looked on the map, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know this route, you know, I followed your instincts. But you're getting the, in behind the wheel, and then before you know it, you're all over the place, yeah. and, and you, then you get to the destination. It's taking you a lot longer. Mm. And you're like, I fucking knew there was a better route than that. <laughs> yeah. And that's how people live their lives. They're on the like LPS. That yeah. yeah, it's yeah. the LPS, life positioning system. Yeah, they're they're in that, and they don't think outside those parameters. And it's it's sad that people do that. Yeah. Do you think that's part of why you like to? Um, not have people control you and if they say do X you want to do Y because you want to break that life positioning system yeah no absolutely 100% mm. and not, something else I'd like to say on that as well is you know we talked about coffee at the start now coffee for me you know I can do that kind of stuff I went vegan for 12 months just to see what it was like mm. I but that all stemmed from my ability when I first managed to quit alcohol and I did that for two and a half years being able to conquer that allows me to conquer anything yeah. now. I now yeah. understand it's that. It's like a test to yourself. It, is, it yeah. is a test, yeah. So I now know that I can break anything. There's yeah. no such thing as you can't do it, providing as you have the purpose to do it. Mm. You know, if someone says, oh, I, I could never drink, I could never stop drinking coffee. Well, if you haven't got a purpose to do it, yeah. there's no reason, there's nothing driving yeah. you to that purpose, then you but won't But if do it. it was going to kill you, you just If it was going to kill you, but if, yeah. you know, for me personally, I drink far too much. I'm like, you know, it's, before you know it, I've got like, I bought a coffee machine at home. It's got like a double yeah. button on it. It's like, you know, I was drinking like Trinkle, loads. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, all night like that, staring at the ceiling, yeah. thinking, what the fuck's going on? And then, you know, you're adding milk to it, lattes, before you know it, you're ballooning up. Yeah. Like, and, you know, I'm against eating dairy and everything. So, but it was, it all stemmed from that being able to stop. That was a massive, forget the alcohol. Yeah. That was a massive turning point for me. That was a, that was a breakthrough in my life. Yeah, knowing that I had control over that, and I would have never five a year before, I'd have never said I could do that. Yeah, but doing that changed something here. Great, yeah. love it. Um, what do you do to relax? What do you do when you're not doing this and your company? Skydive. Yeah. Yeah, I like skydive. You definitely like still. a bit of danger, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do love it. I do yeah. love it. Or oh, I'm up, you know, like going up the hills. I've got a motorbike as well. Right. Got the so motorbike. basically, everything <laughs> dangerous you do <laughs> when you put it like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, do you I mean, wrestle I, with crocodiles just on like, well, Sundays and only yeah. on Sundays. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But no, I do find it hard to sit still. You know, I just think that you know we we are made up sixty five percent of water. Yeah, water stagnates when it's still. We need right. to keep moving. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's when a lot of people, you know, once you start sitting around far too much, I think, you know, that's when a lot of people start, this starts working too much. And the yes. last thing I want to do is be thinking too long yeah. without doing anything. Right. Because, yeah, so. So in a way, maybe it's a bit of therapy. It is therapy. It's yeah. like going out on the bike. I was talking to someone before, get me a lift to the station, he's buying a motorbike. And I'm like, there's nothing like... You know, you, you go in a car, it's a journey. You drive a motorbike, it's an adventure yeah. because you've got to concentrate. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not a case you can just start, you know, people are texting in the cars, mm. you know, can't just think, you know, you know, having conversations, doing all sorts of shit. Yeah. You can't do that on a bike. You've got right. to focus and it takes your mind off everything else. Yeah. It's the same with skydiving. It's the same with climbing a mountain. Yeah. 
that allows a concentrated focus on one thing. So which in a way is like a meditation or yeah. spirituality, 100%. isn't it? Because you're not distracted by yeah. everything. You're getting your mind focused yeah. on whether it's a seed of intention mm. or pool does that for me. I really yeah. like playing pool. Yeah. And when I'm focused on the ball, the yeah. white ball, and I'm not thinking about all the shit that's going exactly. on in the world. And yeah. that is quite, for me, therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. Not, and on that as well, you know, a lot of people freak out about meditation. Meditation for yeah. me is your focused attention at an intention. Yes. You know what I mean? So all you're doing is focusing your thoughts on one thing. And when our heads have got 70,000 thoughts going round in a single day, some people are a lot less, obviously, then yeah. you need to be able to dictate the things you want. Other, otherwise, you end up with the, with the massive stuff you don't want. Mm. The mind and the body will find a purpose. And sometimes if you don't find what it is, it will choose one for you. Yeah. And that'll be unfavorable. Mm. So all right. I think that focus is... Yeah, love it. So this podcast is, a, it's called Disruptive is the main theme of it. Fantastic. Um, it, well, actually it's called Disruptive Entrepreneur, but we, we, we interview anyone and everyone. We're actually going yeah. to interview Theo Pafitas next. So lovely, yeah. diverse guests and people say they love that. Um, but for me, what's important on this show is to have people who are disruptive, who think in a disruptive way. And I think you really fit that bill. So what does Thank that you. word mean to you, disruptive? A pioneer. Yeah. Yeah. A pioneer of... Uh, like, like the English is with the Bremen Watch. Exactly, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's about being a pioneer. It's about not following the, the, the traditions and norm. It's mm. about breaking the status quo and everything you do. Yeah. Because, you know, opportunity, the growth is not in a predefined path. Mm. Mm. So Love it. And now finally then... Um, your company's called Breaking Point. Can you give us like a web address and then let us know where we can get your books and let us know where we can follow you? Yeah, um, my company is called Breakpoint and the web address is break, I'm talking to you, aren't I? Yeah, or you can talk wherever you like. Break, yeah, yeah. High, break yeah. hyphen point dot co dot uk. Yeah. Um, so you can find us on the web, find everything we do. Um, and also the book is on the best place to find that is Amazon. Yeah. It's called Breakpoint. Did you do it on Audible Amazon. as well? You read it? Audible, yeah. yeah, which is doing absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So it's on Audible. It's on, um, um, I was going to say Tinder now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, your, that's your next one. <laughs> it's on uh, Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> we could see where you we were just talking about being focused on one thing we can see where your mind is yeah. yeah lovely and then where do we follow you like Instagram Facebook where are you Instagram, on Instagram yeah I'm on uh, all the known uh, apart from I'm not actually on Snapchat but yeah I'm on Instagram ollie.ollerton um, uh, Twitter Ollie underscore Ollerton um, and Facebook Ollie Ollerton. Yeah. yeah, you can't get away from me. Yeah, yeah. Ollie, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Ollie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Cheers. Awesome. It's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thanks Hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, I did enjoy it. I did. How oh, you did? I never look at the questions. They're just there, just in yeah, case. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just in case. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Really appreciate you giving your time. Likewise. Yeah. If you enjoyed the interview, like and subscribe. Boom. Boom.